Let's get over now to our second session. And I want to talk to you here in this section about discerning the signs of the times. And before I get into some passages of scripture, because we're going to click through many different passages of scripture, it's going to be a little bit like, you know, drinking from a fire hose with the number of passages that we look at. But, but I think you'll be able to put it all into perspective. But I'll tell you a little story first about a man named William Miller. In the year 1816, a man decided to sit down and study his Bible because he wanted to find out when Jesus would return again. And so after two years of study, in the year 1818, William Miller decided Jesus Christ is going to return in glory to this earth somewhere between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. He had a year window. He said, this is when Jesus is going to return. Now, by all accounts, he was an honest, forthright, godly man. And Miller wasn't a lone crackpot. There were uh, many voices sort of echoing a similar message, especially some respected Bible scholars and teachers. But as you might imagine, as the day approached, as it got closer and closer to March 21st, 1843, something like a religious frenzy shook William Miller and his followers because they were sincerely convinced that Jesus Christ was coming again in glory. They sold farms. They sold houses. They drew up wills. People literally gathered together on hilltops to get a better view of the return of Jesus in glory. But William Miller was obviously wrong. Jesus Christ did not return between 1843 and 1844. And history bears the record of this bitter disappointment. One historian wrote this, I'm quoting, both Miller and his followers lived to reap the reward of their foolhardy quest and to suffer crushing humiliation, ridicule, and abject despair. Now, that's just one story among several in the history of the church. And it's the kind of story that makes many people say, why should we concern ourselves with the return of Jesus at all? Why should anybody get worked up about it? You're just liable to be disappointed. Now, I disagree with that reaction to the tragedy of something that happened with William Miller and his followers. Obviously, I don't think William Miller was right. And I think what he did was something of a disaster in his day, especially spiritually speaking. But folks, I'll tell you, there's a very simple reason why I believe that the followers of Jesus Christ should live in active anticipation of his return. You ready? I'm trying to build up a little suspense here. <laughs> it's because Jesus told us to look for his return. Did he not? Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Jesus said this. Watch therefore... For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Now, by the way, Jesus said, you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. So watch. I think it's interesting. I think in that single verse, Jesus rebuked both fellows like William Miller. Though I think he was a sincere but misguided man. He said, you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. But he also rebuked those who said, ah, don't worry about the return of Jesus. People have been thinking he's coming for 2,000 years. Just cool down. No, he told us to watch. But he also said to cool any specific date setting. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Be ready. Watch, 
And then Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. By the way, this is all part of the Olivet Discourse, that this wonderful message that Jesus gave on the Temple Mount, describing more than any other place details of his return. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Do you see that emphasis? Jesus told us to be in active anticipation of his return. Now look, it's easy for a preacher to stand before people and say something and make people feel guilty. The guilt gotcha is pretty easy from the pulpit down to the congregation. So I, I, I'm not saying this just to, you know, point a finger at anybody or make you feel bad, but I, I'll just say this. Would we not say, based on passages like this, that the Christian that, who does not live in active anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ is failing, at least somewhat, in their obedience to Jesus? And again, I'm not saying that to make you feel condemned or guilty. I'm just saying, let's understand that Jesus wants us to live in readiness for his return. Now, because of that, I'm going to give you something of a theory that I have. You're not going to find this exactly in the Bible, but I think it's based on something in the Bible. I believe that Jesus Christ has given every generation some reason to believe that he's coming again. I mean, if you go back to the history of the church, he's given every single generation of Christians some reason. So the fact that I look around the world today and see that there are reasons to believe that Jesus is coming soon, I don't think that makes us unique in all of history. I say what makes us unique is the number and the intensity of reasons that we see today. But I think that Jesus has wanted every generation to believe that he's coming soon. Now, if you want to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8, I want to talk to you about something that Jesus said were not the signs of his coming. You'll see what I mean. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8, it's part of the Olivet Discourse. Jesus described general world conditions during the period between his ascension and the time immediately preceding his glorious second coming. So take a look at this. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now notice, Jesus says at the outset in verse 4, take heed that no one deceives you. Jesus understood that there were many people who would be deceived in the anticipation of his return. Maybe they would be deceived by just not considering it at all. Or maybe they would be deceived in a way like William Miller and his followers were. But Jesus said, take heed that you're not deceived. And then he says this in verse six, see that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You see, what Jesus talks about in these verses are not the things that mark the specific signs of the end. So in verse five, when he mentions false messiahs, is that a specific sign of the end? Jesus said, no, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. When he mentioned wars in verse six, when he mentions famines and pestilences and earthquakes, he says, these are not the specific signs of the end. Now, again, it's as if Jesus is saying, followers of mine, catastrophes are going to happen in history, but there's no single catastrophe that marks a sign of my return. Matter of fact, he said this in verse eight, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. And look, 
Folks, it's just a tendency we have as human beings. In any great war, in any great famine, in any great disaster, it's natural to believe that the world is coming to end. You know, it's dangerous to speak about things that you just get a cursory view of on social media or the internet. But it, it seems to me that some weeks ago, there was some horrific flooding in Pakistan. And, and I, I saw some of the satellite images before and after. And, and it's almost unimaginable. It looked like this massive lake or even a sea was created in this region of Pakistan. You think about all the, and you just think for a moment, would you blame the people directly impacted by that for thinking the world's coming to an end? Well, you could say you would understand why they would feel that in that instance. You would understand it that for a horrific hurricane, for a tremendous earthquake, for a devastating war, you can't blame people for thinking in that circumstance, surely the world is coming to an end. But Jesus said, no, those are not the specific signs. But he did say this, and I can't get away from this phrase in verse eight. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Now you may have heard this before, but it bears repeating. When Jesus called them the beginning of sorrows, he literally called them, these are the beginnings of labor pains. Now, having coached my wife through the birth of three children, I feel like I'm an expert in labor pains. <laughs> I'm glad she's not here. She would, maybe I object or something from the, but it, it's my understanding from a distance that one of the characteristics of labor pains is that the closer you get to the time of the actual birth, that those pains get more intense and they're closer together. And I think that this may be a very real signal to Jesus saying these kind of catastrophes, there's no single catastrophe that marks the end of the age, but you should not be surprised if these events become more close and more intense as the time approaches. They're like labor pains. And certainly we sense that in the world today. So Jesus gave us a tip that in general, maybe we could see these things come to greater frequency and intensity before the end, but there's no specific sign in any of these things. No, Jesus pointed to a specific sign in his Olivet Discourse, verses nine through 14. Look at it with me here now. Matthew chapter nine, verses, uh, chapter 24, verses nine through 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will go cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, I want you to know, in those verses that I just read to you, I still don't think that Jesus has pointed to a pivotal sign. But he gets to that in verse 15. This is the sign that Jesus pointed to. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. The specific sign that Jesus pointed to as the mark of his return is something called the abomination of desolation. Now, what is this abomination of desolation? Friends, I think that this is one of the most critical areas to understand biblically. I've done a lot of reading on what people think the abomination of desolation is. Uh, one writer tried to make the case that the abomination of desolation is totalitarian government in the end times. I don't think so. I think biblically speaking, the, abomina the abomination of desolation points to one particular thing. It's the setting up of an idolatrous image in the Jewish temple as first spoken of by Daniel the prophet. 
Now, Paul also made reference to this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it's also mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. Friends, I got to tell you, any sign that's mentioned by Daniel, by Paul, by John, and especially by Jesus, that is a big and important sign in God's unfolding plan of the ages. Now, because Jesus told his disciples about the abomination and desolation, which is set up by this world leader, we often call him the Antichrist. I don't think that's the best title for him, but that's the one that we're familiar with, so I'll use it. I could go on a whole caveat saying oh, there's better titles, there's better ways to understand, but I'll just use it. When I say Antichrist, people think of the Omen movies or this or that, or, but, but I think that's just the title that we have. This image will be set up by the Antichrist in the middle of the Great Tribulation. And then Jesus warned his disciples about the coming destruction in the Great Tribulation. Now, because Jesus warned his disciples about that, there are more than a few Christians who believe this means that Christians will go through the Great Tribulation. It seems evident. Why would Jesus say these things to his disciples if his disciples would not experience them? But I think that the answer to that is very simple. We know from this passage, and I would say from many passages, that Jesus Christ will come for his church before the fury of the great tribulation. He'll catch them to meet them in the air as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 describes. Yet, this information is valuable for the followers of Jesus. First of all, just so they can understand something about God's plan for the future, but secondly, it's especially valuable for those who will become disciples during this period that we often call the great tribulation. Because there's something you need to understand about the Great Tribulation. It will be both, and this is one of the strange paradoxes of God's work in history. It will be both a time of an outpouring of God's judgment and wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world, but it will also be a time when countless people come to faith in Jesus Christ when there is a harvest of souls, many or most of whom will have to be martyred for their faith in these days. But they will come to Christ. Passages like this will be very helpful for them in those days. We do well to remember that the disciples who heard Jesus give this Olivet Discourse, they saw none of these things that Jesus predicted, yet it was still good for them to hear it. And even if Christians will not go into the great tribulation, which I don't believe they will, I think God will have his great catching away of the church before that, it's good for them to hear and know these things. And especially it's good for those who will become Christians in the great tribulation. Now, if we aren't around to see this pivotal sign, if you and I, as I believe, will not be on the earth to see the abomination of desolation set up in a temple in Jerusalem. Well, then do we have any reason to believe that Jesus is coming soon? I say absolutely yes. Here's reason number one. We see the stage set for the abomination of desolation. The number one aspect to that is that the Jewish people once again have a national presence in the Holy Land. There is a nation of Israel since the year 1948. For centuries, there was only a small Jewish presence in Judea and Jerusalem. And their presence in the region was definite and it was continuous, but it was also small. And in prior generations, it was unthinkable that this handful of Jewish people in the Holy Land could rebuild a temple. Therefore, the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation was highly unlikely until all Israel was gathered together as a nation again in 1948. The restoration of a nation that the world had not seen for some 2,000 years was a remarkable event in the fulfillment, or the future fulfillment, I should say, of prophecy. Now, you may or may not know But the main Jewish group 
leading the charge to rebuild the temple uh, is an organization called the Faithful of the Temple Mount. Uh, I'm going to be straight with you. They're regarded as a weird fringe group in Israel. It's not like a popular uprising. But this group, the faithful of the Temple Mount, they're training a priesthood. They're gathering materials for the temple. They're serious about rebuilding and restoring the temple presence up there. Now people say, well, it could never happen because of the Muslim presence on the Temple of the Mount and uh, because of the uh, obviously Muslim mosques and shrines that are on the Temple Mount. I have two things to say about that. The first one is unlikely, but I'll share with you a little bit of gossip that I heard in Israel. Now I say gossip, not because I think it's untrue, uh, because the person who reported to me really is a reliable person, I believe, so I, I don't have any reason to doubt it, but it's certainly not the kind of thing you'd read in a news report. He said, that Israeli intelligence service, and this would go back many years, maybe 10, 15 years. Israeli intelligence sources keeping track of their own folks in Israel stopped an extremist Jewish group that was absolutely committed to rebuilding the temple. Because what this Jewish group planned to do was... It's going to sound crazy if I'll say it. Catapult a pig onto the Temple Mount. <laughs> Just catapult it out there and make it splat on the Temple Mount. Now, you and I, we think of a flying pig and we think that's kind of funny. But you know who would not be funny to is any Muslim. Because in their mind, that would be an act of gross desecration. And it's the kind of thing that could likely start a war. That's why the Israeli intelligence services, when they learned of this plot, they shut it down immediately. They arrested or apprehended or broke it up or whatever they did because they didn't want to deal with the fallout from that. And when they questioned the people involved in this, they go, you know, you're never going to rebuild a temple if you do this. There's going to be war. And they go, yes, we know. We won't rebuild the temple, but what it'll do is it'll clear away the Muslim presence from the Temple Mount, and then our children will be able to rebuild the temple. That was their thinking. So that's the one aspect. The other aspect, which I think is more realistic, is to think this. Could you imagine a charismatic world leader who was able to make such an amazing peace that could bring together both Jew and Muslim together in a peace treaty so that on the Temple Mount, there could both coexist a Jewish temple and Muslim shrines? You, you would have to say that a world leader who could pull that off diplomatically and politically, well, that, that would be the greatest world leader you've ever seen. Maybe somebody like a antichrist type figure. I, I think that's a more likely scenario, but I do believe with all my heart that there will be a rebuilt temple on that temple mount in which will stand this abomination of desolation. And I gotta say, as I see things prepared for that, as Christians, we have mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, it's thrilling to see prophecy in the process of being fulfilled. On the other hand, we recognize that a rebuilt temple in this age with animal sacrifices made with the intention of atoning for sin, man, that's a direct repudiation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, listen, it, it's not that I want to see a Jewish temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount, but I believe that there will be one, even though the practice of that would be something that would be dishonoring to Jesus. It's fascinating and inevitable, but spiritually it would be a denial of Jesus' work. So we see the stage set for the abomination desolation. Number two, 
We see the political environment the Bible describes in the very last days. The the Bible says that in the very last days, there will be a world dominating ruler. Revelation chapter 13 says this. I'm going to start in the middle of verse 7. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's world domination, folks. Revelation chapter 17, starting at verse 13. These were of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. The Bible says that there will be a world dominating leader in the very last days. And friends, if you don't see the potential for that in the world today, I think you're just blind. The tools for domination and control supplied by high tech, social media and financial controls. They are ready for the use of a world dominating ruler and his government. The stage is set for the kind of government that the Bible describes in the very last days. But we also see, and this is number three, we also see the spiritual environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. For example, the times will be perilous times. Second Timothy chapter three, verse one says this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And for example, secondly, there will be a falling away before the man of sin is revealed. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three says this, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This man of sin is the person that we popularly call the Antichrist. Here he's called two things, the man of sin and the son of perdition. There will be a falling away. And friends, we live in days of great apostasy and denial of the truth. Now, in one sense, this is nothing new. There's been false doctrine and apostasy for 2,000 years in the world. But the modern tools of technology and social media speed and strengthen the spread of of deception all over the world. The stage is set for the spiritual environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. Number four, we see the cultural environment the Bible describes in the very last days. It will be a time when people take pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 12 says this, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Friends, I have to say, so much of what we see in our modern age, especially with the modern obsessions with sexual and gender identity, it's a radical manifestation of those who take pleasure in unrighteousness. Look, unrighteousness has been around a long time. It's nothing new. But there's something radical about the present day in the pleasure that people take in unrighteousness. It's hard to escape the feeling that there's a new energy, that there's a new fervor on behalf of those in the world today who take pleasure in unrighteousness. It'll also be a time when many people are obsessed with the pleasures of life. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said this, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the son of man be. Friends, I think it's remarkable how our culture today is given over to entertainment, to diversions, to distractions. It captures this idea almost to perfection in the world today. Number five, we see the economic environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. 
For example, it'll be a time of a centralized, highly controlled economy. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17 says this. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except for the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Friends, that describes an economic system that not only takes enormous technology, but also enormous control. We're in that day. I mean, can anybody deny that? And, and here's what's strange. I, I'm almost telling on myself when I, when I tell this. 20 years ago, I could have said the same thing. Really? Really? But because these things were in seed form and evident 20 years ago. Now we're astounded 20 years later to look at this and say, it's even more true. It's even truer today. And it all just seems to be moving towards a brink. The friends in my mind is astounding. Look, this is the simplest way that I could put it. The Bible describes a certain environment in the world in the very end days, the very last days before the return of Jesus. And we fit that environment more than I can say any other time in human history. The stage is set for the abomination of desolation as Jesus described. The stage is set for the kind of political environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. The stage is set, number three, for the spiritual environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. Number four, the stage is set for the cultural environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. And then number five, the stage is set for the economic environment environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. To me, this is heavy. Now look, I, I, I want to be very transparent before you. I want to be very sort of objective. I think it's possible that God looks with mercy upon the world and the way things seem to be spinning out of control and pushes a pause button. And a couple hundred years from now, God allows the same kind of conditions that we see presently to, to come about again, and he carries out his plan. Well, wouldn't you say that that's possible? I think you're a fool to bet that way. I think that a wise man or a wise woman says, the stage is set now. I need to be aware and be ready that Jesus Christ could be coming back very soon. I need to allow that to be a purifying aspect in my life. And friends, we understand that there is a sense in which any one of us could go home to Jesus very quickly. Our life is but a vapor. We understand in that sense, but we also have a sense that God has told us what the world is gonna be like in the very last days, and what we see now fits that picture almost to a T. Now I say almost to a T. Because I look at the world today and I see some things and I kind of stroke my chin and I go, that doesn't really seem to fit. Can I give you an example? We know from different passages of scripture, we don't know exactly when in God's timetable and God's schedule, but we know in the very last days, the Bible describes a massive invasion from the north, from a people he calls Gog and Magog that will come down against Israel. And those areas are commonly identified with Russia. It has been for a long time by Bible students. And I'm just not talking about freaky or fringe Bible students, but just solid expositors. Well, yeah, this just seems to fit geographically, linguistically. Yes, from the north. Yes, Russia will come and invade Israel with some allies at some point in God's prophetic timetable. Right, that's just kind of been understood. For some passages in Ezekiel 38, 39. Okay, we get that. 
Now, for a long time, it's been very easy to say, look at the fearsome Russian military. Look at that military machine. It makes total sense that they would do this. Yes, we can fit that. Now, over the last year, what's happened in Ukraine has made us stand back and say, maybe the Russian military isn't as powerful as everybody thought it was. How does that figure in? I don't know. But here's the point. The things that I look at in the world scene today that don't seem to match with something in the Bible, I understand how quickly those things can change. I lived through, as many of you did, that period in the late 1980s when communism fell. Do you understand? It's almost impossible to describe that period to a young person today. That they never grew up with the Cold War the way that we did. That they never understood just, just how adversarial the world was. And they never understood what a mighty opponent the communist world seemed to be to the West. And how people believed that this was just going to go on. And if communism ever faded away, it might fade away in 30, 40, 50 years. But it was going to take a long time. And then you and I, who lived through that period, we saw it in the late 80s. Where it seemed like every day you opened the paper and a new communist government had fallen and the world changed very quickly so here's what i see i see the world set up right now in so many ways that i've just described to you the abomination desolation economic political religious culture i see all that and the areas that don't seem to align i go listen when the time is right those things can change very quickly in the unfolding plan of God. Because if I could go back to this, Jesus has given every generation reason to believe that his return was near because Jesus wants his people to live with an expectation and to be ready. But I believe that given, Jesus has given us us more reason than ever to believe that his return is near and to be ready. So even if you were to leave out everything I said about the abomination desolation, about the uh, political and economic and cultural and spiritual, if you were to leave that all out, I can just conclude with this. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Therefore, you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the son of man is coming. We are called to live with a joyful, confident expectancy with the return of Jesus Christ. My wife, uh, she's not a big social media person. Uh, she'll post things occasionally. But she has started posting something probably a couple years ago uh, that she calls Maranatha Mondays. Every Monday, she'll put up a graphic and says, Maranatha Monday. And she just is it for herself and anybody else who follows her. Let's regularly remind ourselves of that great phrase from the Bible, Maranatha, which means come quickly, Lord Jesus. It was sort of a watchword of the early church. I think it's great for that to be a watchword for us today to anticipate the soon return of Jesus. Now, in our third and final session, which we'll get to after a brief break, I'm gonna talk to you about something that I find absolutely fascinating. I'm gonna to talk to you about what I believe is the actual order of events in the glorious return of Jesus. And I think it's fascinating and I think it's gonna surprise some of you, not all of you, but there's gonna be some surprise. That's what we'll get to in our third teaching session after we take a brief break. Father, we ask that you give us the grace to watch and be ready. Lord, we don't know a day or an hour. 
but we can read the signs of the times and believe that it's soon. So help us to watch and be ready for this uh, wonderful coming, this wonderful parousa that you have promised and we'll receive it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.